Hi, today I would like to give you a little bit of an introduction to Crystal Aligner to tell you a little bit about what the program is about and how we can use it to solve some crystal alignment problems in our scanning electron microscope. So what is the problem that we're trying to, uh, to solve here? So in advanced in situ experimentation, imaging and sample preparation in a scanning electron microscope, possibly with a focused ion beam, we often require alignment of a crystal with the microscope coordinate system. This is of course interesting for crystalline materials such as metals. Um, examples of this are micropillar compression, where we want to probe a certain crystal direction, ECCI imaging, where we want to um, get the contrast of a certain crystal direction, or advanced TM liftouts, where we need certain crystal directions to be aligned in the yeah, transmission electron microscope analysis. Crystal alignment is often constrained by certain factors such as the rotational degrees of freedom. So commonly we have uh, two rotation axes with a limited range in our microscope. We see this here that we have, for example, in a standard FEI stage, we have 360 degree rotation around the z-axis. Then we have a tilt range of maybe 50, maybe 90 degrees, but it's at least limited and usually nothing into the third, in the third axis. Then we can be constrained by low crystal symmetry. In the example of, for example, a 112 direction, we can see that in a cubic crystal system, we have plenty of these 112 directions. But if we then are constrained, for example, by an orthorhombic crystal, we only have four unique 112 directions. So this can be quite uh, a constrained factor that makes our um, alignment more difficult. And of course, if as soon as we have multiple alignment objectives, this is becoming even more difficult. These can even be conflicting. An example of a conflicting alignment objective is shown down here. Um, so we want to, in a cubic crystal, align the 100 direction with the Z um, direction of the microscope and a 112 direction with the X direction of a microscope. Now we know that the 100 and the 112 direction are not perpendicular to each other, but X and Z in the microscopes are perpendicular to each other. So this is actually an objective that cannot be achieved um, so you can of course argue if this makes sense at all, but at least if we have uh, multiple or even conflicting alignment objectives, we need to find a trade-off between things. So what can we do in this case? Um, the obvious thing to do is to increase the rotational degree of freedom, um, which in practice means to get a nice substage, something that looks like this. It's a pricey solution. <clears throat> it increases the complexity of your setup and it may introduce further drift, but it's also the most advanced solution that lets you almost align yeah, almost align arbitrary crystal directions with anything. Like it's a, it's a really good solution. But yeah, the price, increased complexity and drift can be some um, counter arguments to this. Then an alternative is to work with the standard stage, so with what we have in the microscope by default, and optimize our rotations. This may not be advanced enough for all of the problems that we want to face, and in this case we need maybe a substage, but it's actually good enough for the majority of problems. Um, and this program I developed, Crystalliner, is free of charge, so it means you don't have to pay for an expensive stage, and by not having the additional stage we might be able to reduce drift. Now I don't really know in person how much the drift issue, uh, how big the issue the drift actually is, because I never worked with a substage. This is only something I read about. Um, so if it's not as big an issue, then just let me know. <laughs> so I developed a program Crystal Aligner to do the crystal alignment, and it's a computer program, as the name says, for alignment of crystals in a scanning electron microscope, or actually any other system for that matter. It's an add-on to the crystallographic toolbox MTEX. Um, and MTEX, of course, is very good to model rotations in these things. So we apply the MTEX syntax to define the crystal directions, the crystal orientations, and also the rotations of the crystal in the coordinate system of the scanning electron microscope. This also means that the crystal directions by default respect the crystal symmetry. All of these are implemented in MTEX, so it's pretty robust. And you'll also, of course, benefit from all the updates that are constantly implemented into MTEX. And it's, of course, also straightforward to plot these orientations and to integrate this application with other applications if you're interested in that. Then the um, optimization problem itself is being solved by a genetic algorithm, which is part of the MATLAB optimization toolbox. Yeah, and it performs a constrained global optimization. More about this later on.
So just to give you a very fast and simple example of what the toolbox does, we can tell the toolbox align the one, one, one of the 111 directions in the cubic crystal with the microscope z-axis. This is our initial orientation here, and we can see here this is the z uh, inverse pole figure, and we want this, um, this orientation to move towards the 111. Then we let it basically optimize the uh, rotations. So it does the optimization algorithm to achieve this alignment. Um, you can see that here the fit value gets lower and lower and lower. So this is basically the error decreasing. At some point, we don't have no change anymore. And the optimization algorithm then returns um, rotation instructions for how to rotate the different axes of your stage to get to this ideal alignment of the 111 with the Z direction of your microscope. So this is a pretty simple example just to show you what this is about. So in the code, we want to um, we want to of course specify what our crystal alignment objective is. And as I already mentioned earlier, we do this um, by the standard MTEC syntax. So we start by defining the specimen symmetry and crystal symmetry. So here we just use a triclinic specimen symmetry by default. And in this example, we say crystal symmetry is m minus three m, so it's a cubic crystal. And then in the mineral, we can give this any name like a beta phase, alpha phase. Here we are just called cubic phase. This should be set because later on the plots are gonna show this uh, name. So this, you should give your crystal some kind of name for this to work nicely. Um, then we can, based on the crystal symmetry and specimen symmetry, um, define the crystal orientation. So we just do this by orientation, Euler, and then we put in the Euler angles. So three angles and then the crystal symmetry and the specimen symmetry. Then we want to uh, define a microscope axis that we want to align with. So here this is the Z vector and Z vector by standard coordinate system, I'll show this later, is usually the, the direction of the electron beam. Uh, so down the column. And then we want to define the crystal direction that we want to uh, do the alignment with. So here we want to align the 111 direction in this um, cubic crystal. And actually we define this as HKL, so this means you want to align the plane normal. In a cubic crystal, it doesn't really make a difference, but in lower symmetry um, crystal structures, it's of course important if you want a plane normal or a direction as UVW. And as a last argument, we say, yes, please um, use all the symmetrically equivalent 1, 1, 1 directions. So we set this to true, so it will also look at 1, minus 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, and so forth. That's basically everything we have to do to uh, define the alignment objective. And we can define up to two alignment objectives. Of course, like uh, aligning three directions uh, with three microscope X does not make any sense because with two directions, we already have the full positioning of the crystal um, defined. So one or two alignment objectives you can implement. So now we want to model the stage. Um, here I show an example of uh, the FEI Helios stage. Um, I will explain a little bit how you model the stage in, in Crystal Aligner and then you can basically apply this for your stage setup and this can be yeah, arbitrarily extended. So you can see if you look down the stage from top view, this is basically looking down the electron column, um, we can see that we have a right-handed coordinate system, so X, Y, Z with your right hand, and that we have a rotation axis going around Z here. So this is our normal rotation of 360 degrees. And this is actually a clockwise rotation, which in the convention of the right-handed uh, coordinate system is a negative rotation. And well, counterclockwise is a positive rotation. So this rotation sense means that when we um, in this structure stage dot rot uh, define the Z vector that we have to put a minus in front of this. So negative rotation around the Z axis. So then when we look at the front view, so this is basically looking through the microscope door, um, the front view, we can see that we have a tilt axis around X as well. This one is a little bit of the constraint axis, kind of. Um, but well, here we can see that actually the rotation is counterclockwise, which is positive rotation sense in a right-handed coordinate system, which means that now we can define the X vector in here with a positive sign or like no sign in this case. So then we have these LB, UB, this is lower bound, upper bound. So here we can actually put in the stage limits and these can either be the hard limits or the soft limits of your stage. It doesn't really matter. Um, so for the X vector, this is the tilt. We say we want to be able to rotate from zero to 20 degrees. And of course this tilt range in an FEI Helios can go further, but I'll explain later why in this case I limited it to 20 degrees. And we allow a full rotation around the Z vector. So this is minus 180 to plus 180, so degrees. 
And then last, uh, last but uh, not not less important is the order of the rotations or the order of the stages. This is quite important. Um, so if you look here on the right side, we actually have this rotation one, which is the rotation of the z-axis on top of the tilt axis. What this means, just to conceptualize this, rotation one does not transform rotation two, but rotation two transforms rotation one. So if I tilt this lower axis here, I'm actually gonna um, actually gonna tilt the rotation axis one. But if I rotate around rotation axis one, the tilt axis is not affected. So this is kind of the order of rotation, which is quite important. And the way you define it here is basically uppermost uh, to lowermost um, rotation axis. So the rotation that's not transformed will be rotation one. The rotation that transforms your specimen and rotation one will be rotation two. And you can extend this to three, four, five, as you like. So this is quite important to uh, state and you put this here. So in this case, yeah, rotation or rotation around the Z vector is one and the tilt here around the X vector is two. So then there's also some optimization post-processing parameters that you can specify. I'm not gonna go in detail here, but it's all nicely listed in the documentation. Um, Crystal Aligner uses the MATLAB Global Optimization Toolbox, and there's of course some parameters you can set here. Um, we use the function GA for the single and GA multi-objective for the multi-objective crystal alignment. And there's some parameters such as population size, function tolerance, and objective weights that can be set. You can look a little bit into the um, examples to, to see what are reasonable parameters for that. Then we have also some post-processing parameters we can set, and this is mostly the additional output that can support FIP lamella preparation at an angle. Um, I'll show this later in the application example um, why this can be useful, but you can activate this output or deactivate this output depending on what you use the code for. So let's now go through an example. Um, so this example is the same example that has been uh, yeah, published in the research paper that is associated with this program, and it's example two on the GitHub page as well. Or like if you run the code, there's an example two this that kind of concerns this. So the example is that we want to lift out a TM lamella from an aligned beta titanium crystal, which is a BCC structure, for in situ TM tensor testing. What we want to do is we want to have an aligned zone axis in the TM that is a 113. This means that we have to actually align the 113 direction with the y-axis of the microscope. So let's have a look down here. This is the lift out kind of geometry. This is the microscope coordinate system. And how this usually looks is that this is the FIP lamella and then we take this FIP lamella out and thin it. And later on, we're gonna look through the thinnest direction of the FIP lamella in the transmission actor microscope. So we're gonna look along the one, whoops, along the 113 direction. And the 113 direction here yeah, is the y, the y direction in the scanning electron microscope. So we want to align those two. But we also actually want to do a tensor test along the 110 direction. And uh, the tensor direction will then basically be this direction later on in the TM. I'm going to show this later. And this means we want to align the 110 direction of our crystal with the z direction of our microscope. And again, the z direction is parallel to the electron beam. So these are the two objectives we have for this crystal. Then, of course, we also need to um, define the stage. So this is again the FEI Helios stage that I um, that I showed you in the example earlier. And we want to allow a full rotation around uh, the set vector and a tilt of 0 to 20 degree. And I'll tell you why we only limit ourselves to 20 degree. And that's because we want to actually have a buffer of 52 degree tilt that we need for the FIP machining. This means, for example, if I now figure out, hey, the perfect alignment can be achieved by 15 degrees tilt, then I have to go to 15 plus 52 degree tilt um, to do the to do the FIP machining. So we basically have a little bit of a soft limit that we have to put in with these 20 degrees to not extend our hard limit when we do the FIP machining. And the stage order is the same as I showed you earlier. So how would this work in practice? So in practice, you would define this alignment objective in your code and you will uh, define a stage setup. And then you would go to your microscope and you would acquire a quick and coarse EBSD map. This can look like here. So uh, as I said, it's not a pretty map, but you want something fast. You don't want to sit there for hours and make like a super detailed EBSD map. Um, then you can click at some grains using the EBSD software and see the Euler angles. You can then take these Euler angles and put them into your script. When you do that, you can then run the code and then you will see the uh, initial alignment of your crystal. 
in this case, for example, when we run the code, we get these plots here, and we can see that the 110 direction is already quite close to the z direction, and that the 113 direction is already very close to the y direction. We can see the same thing here in the inverse pole figures as well, that we're very close already to our alignment objective. This is not a crazy coincidence. This basically means I've been clicking through a couple of these grains to figure out, okay, or looked at the color triangle to know, okay, this grain is already quite promising and close to the alignment objective. Of course, if you take something that's very far away with these very constrained rotation axes in your uh, setup and two, two objectives, you're not going to be able to get a good alignment. So in this example, you do a little bit of try and error, click some grains to figure out something that's already quite close to align. And then you basically run the optimization code. So the multi-objective genetic algorithm finds trade-off solutions between both objectives. As it's a constraint of the optimization problem, it means that there's not always an optimal solution, but it will find, let's say there's not an ideal solution where uh, both, both objectives are perfectly fulfilled, but it will find the most optimal solution for your problem. So in the genetic algorithm, we actually go through generations of possible solutions. And the first generation is basically random, random, let's say, tilt and rotation angles within the constraints that you've uh, set to see, okay, are maybe some of these angles, angle pairs, some pairs that give a good solution to achieve the alignment. So this is actually those dark blue dots you see here. And some of them give a quite high error, like this one or this one, for example. Um, but then in the first generation, basically the algorithm will look at, okay, is there already some solutions that are quite good? And then based on that and some random mutation, it will then in the second generation propose some new solutions to the alignment problem. And this way, by kind of adapting the, they call it the fittest solutions, and also by putting, putting some mutation in there to not narrow down to a local optimization, um, you will then get better and better with each generation. So on this plot, you can see that the error decreases quite fast with the generation count. So you can see here the generation starts at 1 and goes up to 15, which is red. And if we look into a, a magnified area here, we can see that uh, already after generation 8 or something, we kind of form this front here, which is the front of optimal trader solutions. So of course, the perfect solution would be 0, 0, but we can't achieve this with our stage setup and uh, this, the problem that we've defined. So these are all best solutions, but you have to make a trade-off if you prefer solution one or solution two. Um, in this case, we've used a, a method called TOPSYS to kind of find the most optimal solution, and it chose this solution here as the most optimal. So we get around 0 0.8, 0 0.8 degrees uh, misfit uh, for objective two, and around 0 0.2 or something for generation uh, for objective one. So this is how the optimization basically works. It will find the best solutions and narrow in on the best solutions. And you can also choose this one manually here. It's a setting you can set to say, okay, from all the, the best solutions, which one do you want to choose? You can do this manually as well. So in this case, we have those 0 0.1 and 0 0.8 deviation from the alignment objectives. And the instructions were to um, tilt the sample by 7.2 degrees tilt and uh, yeah, 132.5 degree rotations rotation. This means that we then did our um, FIP lift out at 59.2 degree tilt. So that's where we did the fibbing. Um, so you kind of take this 7.2 degree tilt as your zero plane. This also means usually in um, FIP, FIP lamella preparation, you do trenches on both sides, which have kind of the same uh, X and Y kind of uh, parameters and Z depth and these things. Of course, when you do this at an angle, one side, you will have to machine a little bit more than on the other side. And that's basically this additional output that you can get that gives you an estimate of, it's not very accurate, but it's a good estimate of how large your trenches should be on both sides. Um, so which parameters to choose. So after the final thinning step, this is actually how the TM lamella looks. So I think it's a quite nice lamella. And we were able then to do a TKD orientation measurement on this lamella. And you can see that now the 110 is aligned with the Y direction and the 113 is aligned with the Z direction. Note here that now Y and Z are exchanged because we have uh, tilted the lamella from the lift out to the thinning by 90 degrees. But it's yeah, basically the alignment that we wanted. And then another validation here is then later on in the TM, we've machined these uh, nice stock bone specimens. And I've took a se selected error diffraction pattern right here. And you can see that we are in the minus 113 zone axis and that we have a 110 um, axis that is perfectly parallel with the tensor axis. So everything has worked pretty well. 
that's basically everything I want to show you. So um, you can go and check out the paper in which, it, uh, in which you can find all the information. This is also part of the Git repository. And of course, on GitHub, there's a lot of documentation. So there's five different examples and a lot of explanation that I just gave about how to set up the stage and these things. So I will encourage you to check this out, download the code, and start by running the examples to um, get a hang of how the code works. I hope you enjoy this. Yeah, bye.